Age cleanup uh, spill plan. Uh, I'm sure you didn't review this, uh, but you told me that people who were responsible and all were fired and people changed. Uh, have we got that, uh, that organization chart? The guy that was responsible for signing this, we've got two people here, uh, Saucier, and then Tolbert signed it for uh, Saucier. Uh, he's, still, he's still there. Uh, got that circle there, the yellow thing. Uh, so he wasn't fired. He's, he gave carte blanche. This is the approval for BP to drill and the conditions by which they drill. And it refers to a 500-page document. That 500-page document, uh, I, I've, my staff tells me, it says it has spill provisions for dealing with a cleanup for seals, walruses, uh, and um, uh, polar bears, none of which I have in the Gulf. It looks like all this was sort of carte blanche approval. It, is, is that what it appears to be? And is this guy going to get fired or anyone? Uh, uh, and, and, and this guy's still making the decisions. This is Saucier, and here, here is Saucier here making the decision on the, uh, implementing the moratorium. Congressman Michael, let me uh, respond uh, with two points. Uh, first, uh, while it is true that there were uh, people who committed uh, both uh, criminal and uh, ethical uh, conduct that is uh, and, and he, he wrong. And he signed or was well, hold on, let me, let me finish. for issuing let, let, the me, permit. let me finish, Congressman Micah. Yeah. The, uh, the reality of it is that uh, there, are very, there are many good people within the agency. Uh, there are some bad people. Those are being dealt with. With respect to the document that you refer to and with respect to people that were involved concerning the approvals of the Maconda well and what happened there. Okay. I have asked the Inspector General to take a look at that. And, and the Inspector give, give General will provide us their own independent yeah. review, which I would be happy to share as appropriate with members of this committee. I'd, I'd appreciate a list and the status of those who were res held responsible. Thank you. Right. Maybe yeah. we could submit that to the committee. Yeah. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, and now you five minutes to the general lady from California, Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the Secretary and to Mr. Bromwich. Um, series of questions. From the outside, there is an ethical crisis at MNS. Whether you change the name or not, there has been a history of drug, sex, rock and roll concerts. And I am concerned, based on the Post article today, that says that there is a much higher degree of revolving door that exists in the oil industry than anywhere else in that three out of every four lobbyists had some relationship to the government. Uh, we know there are 12 former employees of MMS that are now lobbying for the oil industry. Uh, Mr. Brownwich and Secretary, I'd like to know what you're going to do now to freeze out those 12 former employees from interacting with MMS. Well, we, we will certainly make sure that they observe the current ethical rules that exist that restrict their contacts to some extent. Uh, but one of the things I have to do is to gather information from people who have the information. If they happen to be former employees of the agency, I'm not going to exclude them for that reason. But I'm certainly not going to give their information any more weight uh, than anyone else's. I agree. I read the same article you did, and I, I am troubled by it. Um, I, I think what I can tell you and tell the committee that you'll never see me in that position. I'll t say right now uh, that I'll self-impose a lifetime ban on contacts with the agency, and I hope that sets an example for other people in the agency uh, and other people throughout government. I agree it is unseemly. Well, it I guess from our perspective, can you take action independent of Congress passing a bill to restrict former employees from having access to the agency? Well, let me give you an example. I've actually met with two of the former directors who are now part of trade associations uh, within the last couple of weeks. But that was at your request. No, it was, at, it was at their request. But I am in the business right now of trying to gather information from a variety of sources, including from trade associations, because they have relevant information to provide bearing on some of the issues that the secretary and I are working on. 
I'm going to give them uh, a hearing, but I'm also going to give all other groups, including environmental groups, uh, including... Okay, I understand that. I have a limited amount of time. So okay. I, my question was, can you act independent of Congress in creating some restrictions uh, around access to the agency after employees have left? Yes, we can, right, but we need you. to do it in a thoughtful way. All right. So you'll report back once you've decided on what you're going to do to the committee? Sure. All right. Um, the GAO report to this committee indicated that the revenue share the government collects for oil and gas produced in the Gulf ranks 93rd out of 104 revenue collection regimes around the world. I think most of us find that stunning and shocking. What are you going to do to change that so that the royalties being received from the Gulf are reflective of um, the world as a whole, um, at least the, the, the international average of royalties received around the world. Uh, Congresswoman uh, Spear, let me just say that uh, the royalty issue and getting a fair return to the American taxpayer is uh, foremost in our minds. We have been working on it. Uh, we are working on it. We have proposals to change how royalties are in fact collected to make sure that the American taxpayer is getting a fair return for royalties, not only in the offshore, uh, but also on the onshore where you have a circumstance that probably is even worse, where you still have the same royalty rate uh, that existed since the 1920 Mineral Leasing Act was passed at 12.5 percent. So we are uh, making the kinds of changes that will bring in the right level of royalties and at the same time make sure that there is accountability with respect to to, to, the, to, to the auditing functions related to that. And when will those be put in, into place and do you need con congressional action to do that? We, we are already working on it. We are moving forward with it. It is uh, being put into place as we speak. The elimination of the royalty and kind program was part of that effort and uh, they are continuing efforts That's to good news address to the hear. issue. Uh, one last question. My understanding along with uh, Congressman Micah's uh, reference is that this particular 600 page document was reviewed by two people for a total of 10 hours. So by anyone's measurement, it was inadequate. I don't care if you're a speed reader. Um, there is no way that in 10 hours you can give the kind of attention to that document. What are you doing moving forward to make sure the employees doing that kind of review are both qualified and have adequate amount of time to do the review? With the, the reorganization that we have uh, put on the table uh, and the resources that we have asked from Congress to be able to do uh, the right kind of work in uh, ensuring safety uh, and ensuring environmental protection uh, should address those issues. The gentlewoman's time is, the gentlelady's time has expired. I now yield uh, to the gentleman, uh, Mr. Turner. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I have a few items on a timeline that lead up to the uh, the explosion in the oil field and the, the uh, oil leak. And um, I'd like to go over those items and, um, and get some of your responses to them. We focus a lot on what happens after the explosion. I'd like to focus on the period leading up to it. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like this, this timeline included in the record. Uh, the timeline begins with January 29, 2009, and the Secretary being declared uh, the, the Secretary. He's appointed on, on that date and declares himself the new sheriff in town. This is January 2009. In February of 2009, in a site-specific exploration plan filed by BP, it states that it was, quote, unquote, not required to file a scenario for a potential blowout of the Deepwater Well. March in 2009, as we have a new sheriff in town, the whistleblower, a whistleblower brought forth an issue of a safety breach by BP in the Gulf of Mexico to the attention of MMS. Quote, the whistleblower who was hired to oversee the company's databases that housed documents related to its Atlantis project discovered that the drilling platform had been operating without a majority of the engineer approved documents it needed to run safely. No action was taken by the agency. But the most important thing was two months after the whistleblower came forward, May 2009, MMS fails to perform a standard monthly inspection of Deepwater Horizon. But what's happening in the Secretary's office, May of 2009, our Interior Secretary is speaking at the Wind Energy Conference in Chicago. June 17, 2009, MMS proposes new rules to require oil and gas operators to develop and implement, quote, safety environmental management systems for offshore drilling. 
The rule is still not finalized one month and one year later. Um, in June of that same month that these rules were, were provided um, but not finalized, Secretary Salazar hires Sylvia Baca away from BP America to become his Deputy Assistant Secretary of Lands and Materials Management, according to this timeline. Summer 2009, the MS, MMS awards Transocean's U.S. Gulf of Mexico operation a safety award for excellence. And our Secretary directs MMS to begin focusing on promoting wind energy. Elizabeth Birnbaum assumes duties as the director of MMS. The New York Times reported that, quote, in particular, she was tasked with handling the politically charged issue of citing the 25-mile Cape Wind Farm off of Cape Cod. But what happens the next month, August of 2009, MMS fails to perform a standard monthly inspection of Deepwater Horizon. August of that same month, White House request, at the White House's request, Secretary Salazar takes a break from your wind energy efforts uh, to begin the big effort of selling health care reform. August of 2009, you travel throughout the West to tout Obama's stimulus plan. I understand from this timeline that on the 21st of August that you were in Grand Canyon South Rim on the highlighting 10.8 million of stimulus dollars. Uh, 8.20, uh, you were at in Utah, 3.6 million of stimulus dollars. And 8.20, again, you were in Oregon on stimulus dollars. That very next month, the National Oceanographic Oceanic Atmospheric Administration sends MMS a letter about the offshore drilling proposal saying MMS understated environmental impacts of the new drilling proposal. September 8th of that month, uh, Salazar says during an interview at Reuters, right now we are focused on health care reform. In fact, CBS reports in November of 2009 that anticipating a struggle, the White House deputized Interior Secretary Ken Salazar and former Sec Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle to join Vice President Joe Biden in trying to clear the way for health care bills overhaul the, uh, reform of the next several weeks. But MMS is busy. MMS has a renewable energy um, task force meeting in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. And with all this activity happening in November, what happens in the Gulf in December? December 2009, MMS fails to perform the standard monthly inspection of Deepwater Horizon. Um, they again fail to perform the inspection in January, um, and then through a series of notifications that BP provides to the agency, um, the, um, the specifications from Deepwater are continued to be adjusted. MMS responding in seven minutes to one request for modification, four and one half minutes to another after having routinely not shown up for standard inspections. And in April, the deep water horizon rig explodes and then sinks. And I believe the secretary is there by April 30th um, after attending on April 27th, um, participating in a ceremony on wind turbines um, April 28th, um, announcing the approval of the Cape Wind project and then you're attending um, in the Gulf to take a look at, at what has occurred. Ge it sounds like a significant amount of inactivity. The gentleman's time has expired. And I would appreciate your response. I believe my staff has a copy of the timeline, which they can also provide to you. Mr. Turner, if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, respond, even though the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the fact is the uh, United States Department of the Interior uh, has a major mission to uh, protect and uh, preserve the natural resources of America, both onshore as well as offshore, as well as uh, being the custodian of, of America's history. And in that mission, uh, we work on the set of issues relating to Native Americans and uh, all of the other assignments that we have within the Department of Interior. Specifically, with respect to uh, many of the things that you cite in there, uh, I have spent probably more time on uh, the comprehensive energy program for the nation that uh, the President uh, and I have been championing than on almost any other issue. But I can tell you that within that comprehensive energy plan, which we are confident uh, we will see unfold uh, for this nation, that you will have a broad energy portfolio that will include oil and gas and at the same time include the new energy frontier of solar and wind and geothermal, which we have worked on very hard. Now, I will say uh, this uh, to you, uh, Mr. Turner, that uh, without uh, equivocation, we have spent a huge amount of time 
with respect to all of the issues relating to MMS, uh, and they have included changing the ethics culture, moving forward with a new direction on the Outer Continental Shelf from what was left over from the prior administration, and moving forward to standing up uh, a renewable energy program. So we work hard. Uh, we cover a lot of ground, and uh, we have a lot of ground to cover in the future. Right. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Chu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we know that the blowout preventers failed with BP and, and with enormously tragic consequences. Now, it's my understanding that an inspector does not actually have to witness in person the blowout preventer tests, uh, but can simply review paperwork from the oil company operators, and um, they can basically take their word for it. Uh, we know that these tests can be successfully faked, uh, as illustrated by several cases. Uh, this practice is um, just unimaginable, and it cuts corners and compromises the oversight mechanism and validity of the tests. Um, so how, how will the reorganization of MMS work to improve these inspection practices, and what specific improvements do you anticipate making to make this BOP uh, test actually effective? And what are your thoughts about having these types of tests certified as safe by independent third-party inspectors that are selected by federal regulators and not the oil companies? Uh, Congresswoman Chu, uh, it is a very good question, and it is something which uh, we have been working on. It really relates to two parts to the reforms uh, within uh, the OCS. And the first of those is having uh, the right standards in place, and many of those uh, standards were set forth in the 30-day report which uh, President Obama directed that I deliver to him. Many of those standards are now being implemented uh, with respect to the notice to lessees that uh, Director Bromwich uh, spoke about a little bit earlier. And then finally, uh, with respect to the enforcement of those standards, there needs to be a significantly beefed up effort with respect to the agency's uh, inspection capabilities, because right now it is uh, a fool's errand to think that 60 uh, inspectors can essentially go out and uh, inspect all of the different uh, OCS uh, uh, facilities, including production facilities that are out there. So you will be coming forth with new regulations pertaining to this particular practice? Uh, yes. Um, well, then it uh, leads to another question, which is about new regulations. And um, uh, one of the problems with the current regulatory uh, system is that it takes a long time for any improvements. And in fact, it took nine years for regulations related to pipeline safety to work its way through the process and take effect. So how will the reorganization of MMS work to, to resolve this, this issue of this delayed implementation of new and necessary regulations? Well, the, the, the reorganization itself, uh, there will be two parts to essentially dealing with the outer continental shelf uh, beyond the revenue side, and one of them will be to manage the resource. The, the other unit will be to provide uh, the safety and enforcement, uh, and uh, we will make sure that we are moving forward to address all the issues uh, and uh, all the lessons uh, to be learned uh, from this tragedy. But my question is, how long will it take? And what, we, what will you do to make sure that, that it's accelerated? But Co Congresswoman uh, Chu, I think some people might say that we should have uh, waited for another six months, eight months, uh, until we found out exactly all of the results of all the investigations. Our view from day one has been that uh, we would uh, work on the issue as fast as we can. And so the 30-day report that was delivered to the President is something is a report that has uh, many rules and requirements and standards which are already being implemented, some of them through notice to lessees and some of them through uh, rulemaking that will be conducted by uh, Director Bromwich. Okay. And uh, finally, let me ask this. Um, under De Interior Department regulations, um, oil companies use models developed by MMS to predict the likelihood of oil reaching the shore following a spill. In the Deepwater, uh, Deep Deepwater Horizon case, um, these models incorrectly predicted that there was a 0% likelihood of oil reaching most shores in Florida, Alabama, and Louisiana. Um, I mean, it, suge it suggests, of course, that these models are outdated and uh, that the regulations re relating to the oil response plans need to be revisited. 
So my question is, does MMS need to reexamine all of these oil spill response plans, particularly with regard to these kinds of predictions, which are clearly incorrect and way off, and how will the MMS reorganization help this process? The answer is uh, yes uh, on drilling safety and containment measures and oil spill responsibilities, and I would like Director Bromwich to comment on it as well. You're quite right, Congress, well, Cong Congresswoman, that, that the oil spill response plans are plainly inadequate. Uh, and that is one subject on which I'm going to be gathering information on the public forums that we're going to be holding uh, over the next month and a half with an eye towards not only insisting in the short term before any new regulations are implemented that those oil spill response plans be substantially revised if they're going to pass muster, but also with an eye towards getting out new regulations in the future. We'll make sure that that's the standard uh, from now on. And you're reviewing all the oil General response Woman's, plans? Yes. General Lady's time has, re has expired. I now yield to the gentleman from Tennessee, and let me also wish him happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have the honor of sharing a birthday yesterday with the uh, chairman, and uh, he sent me a note saying that he thinks we should make it a national holiday, and that was, <laughs> <laughs> that was a very nice note. Mr. Secretary, <laughs> Mr. Secretary, thank you for uh, coming here. I've sat through hearings uh, in the Transportation Committee and the Resources Committee on the BP oil spill, and in both of those hearings, uh, the uh, witnesses have mentioned that over 40,000 wells have been uh, uh, drilled in the Gulf since 1960, and my staff got uh, some information from your department uh, earlier today saying since 1947, more than 50,000 wells have been drilled in the Gulf of Mexico. And there's been, it, it's an, it's a, would you not agree it's an astonishing, it's a, almost an astonishingly safe, clean history that, that we have there in the Gulf? I mean, there have been almost no, there's, there's never been anything even close to this BP's uh, spill. In fact, I'm told that there are more spills for, out of uh, ships than there are from these uh, rigs. I, Congressman Duncan, I, I agree with you. And in fact, I think it was that history of uh, safety over all of those uh, times, 50,000 wells, which essentially was the empirical foundation upon which the national framework has been built uh, with respect to uh, oil and gas production in the Outer Continental Shelf. And I'm told that there are now 3,600 structures in the Gulf right now. Uh, um, let me, uh, Governor Engler wrote a, a column for the Washington Times a few weeks ago, and, he's, and the headline says, Drilling Moratorium is a Jobs Moratorium. And he said this, he said, The moratorium immediately shut down 33 deep water rigs in the Gulf, including 22 near, near Louisiana, uh, this action could cost 3,000 to 6,000 Louisiana jobs in the next two to three weeks, and potentially 20,000 by the end of next year. Uh, for every one employee on an oil rig, there are nine employees on shore supporting that one employee. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's my main concern, because not only have I read, did I read this by Governor Engler, but repeatedly I've seen on the news reports uh, these uh, oil workers um, in the Gulf area uh, almost in a panic uh, situation about all the thousands of jobs that uh, uh, are being uh, destroyed or potentially could be destroyed. Congressman uh, Duncan, let me just say that uh, we too are concerned and uh, we are aware of uh, the issues. Uh, our view and my view in issuing the moratorium is that it was the right way to move forward to put the pause button in place until we can answer three fundamental questions, uh, drilling safety, uh, blowout containment uh, capability, as well as uh, oil spill response capability. If we were to have another blowout in the Gulf of Mexico uh, today or next week, uh, we could not uh, have the oil spill response capability to, to deal with those blowouts. The effort which uh, Exxon and Shell and Chevron and ConocoPhillips came up with uh, yesterday is a beginning point of uh, that conversation relative to how we address one of those three fundamental issues. And Director Bromwich's uh, set of me meetings and hearings around the country will help us answer those three fundamental questions so that we can determine how to move forward with respect to the uh, pause button in place. Charles, uh, on another point, Charles Krauthammer, the columnist and commentator who I think almost everybody agrees, even if they don't agree with him, they think he's one of the smartest men in this city. He, 
he wrote recently, he said, environmental chic has driven us out there. He, he asked the question why we were drilling in 5,000 feet of water in the first place, and he says, quote, environmental chic has driven us out there. Environmentalists have succeeded in rendering the Pacific and nearly all the Atlantic coasts off limits to oil production, and of course, in the safest of all places on land, we've had a 30-year ban in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. I've seen articles that say something like 83 or 84 percent of the uh, Outer Continental Shelf is off limits to oil production. Uh, and that, uh, that also is a concern uh, of mine. And, and then finally, before my time runs out, I see the yellow light on. I will say to Mr. Bromwich, Bromwich, I'm concerned we've changed the name and there seems to be a, a goal of emphasizing enforcement. And I'm just wondering, are, are we going to have a gotcha type agency, agency now? Are you going to, uh, because most of these companies, let's, let's forget about BP, let's, let's consider them a bad actor. But most of these companies are doing a, a good job and complying with all the laws. And I agree with you. It's not going to be, we're not going to have a gotcha culture, but we're going to have clear rules and we're going to have aggressive inspections and violations of those clear, clear rules will be dealt with severely. I think that's the right kind of regulatory regime to have. And if you find a violation, are you going to give a company a chance to correct it or are you going to immediately come down on them and just shut them down? That's a very fact-specific determination. We'll have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. All right. Gentlemen's time has expired. And I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, um, Congressman Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Salazar, um, one of the things that we, uh, you know, I uh, head up the, the Coast Guard subcommittee in the uh, on Transportation Committee, and the um, one of the things that we were concerned about is the what role do you all see the Coast Guard playing uh, in the future? Uh, you know, um, the legislation passed by the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure will require much more significant role for the Coast Guard in the approval of oil spill response plans, which is crucial given that the Coast Guard is responsible for managing the response to the spills. So what steps, if any, are uh, MM MMS and the Coast Guard taking now to strengthen the role of the Coast Guard? And by the way, that's been one of their complaints, that they're asked to be responsible for overseeing the cleanup, but they don't have enough say um, in creating the plan. Uh, did you know that? They've actually testified to that. Either one of Let you. me, uh, Congressman Cummings, if I may, the, the role that we have uh, seen playing out with respect to the response to the Deepwater Horizon blood and the, the BP oil spill has been one where we have been working hand-in-hand uh, -hand with uh, Admiral Allen and as a National Incident uh, Commander, um, and uh, we, it's, been, it's been continuous. Uh, you know, we will look back at uh, the Deepwater Horizon tragedy and uh, look at the lessons learned, uh, including uh, uh, the capacities that are out there uh, with respect to the, the Coast Guard and others. But uh, the fact of the matter is that um, the relationship in terms of uh, the structure that has been set up to respond to the oil spill response uh, has worked well between Interior and the Coast Guard and other agencies that are also involved. Well, I've got to tell you, again, um, we've had testimony within, i say, the last three weeks, and I will get you that information, um, where they have told us that they want, and then, this is not Admiral Allen, uh, they want more say in the development of the response, emergency response plan, uh, because they just feel like by the time, if you're going to call on them to oversee the cleanup, they should be more involved in the, in the beginning. So I'll, I'll get that to you. You might want to take a look at that. Uh, Let me I'm just say, Congress, you didn't know that. No, I, I, do know, I do know that. Let me just say this, Congressman Cummings. The uh, fact is that the oil spill response uh, issue is one of the three most central issues that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And uh, that issue will necessarily involve, should involve, and will involve, I will make sure that it happens, uh, a, a close collaboration with the Coast Guard because we're not going to move forward until we uh, have uh, a, a assuredness with respect to the adequacy of oil spill response plans. Now, Mr. Secretary, um, although the deep water horizon was registered in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, 
Captain Hennon, the uh, Deputy Commissioner of Maritime Affairs with the Republic of the Marshall Islands, is reported to have testified before the joint MMS Coast Guard panel examining this accident that the RMI, as a flag state, did not inspect the drilling equipment and systems on the deep water. He reportedly indicated that such inspections are left up to the MMS. And we understand that MMS often relies on offshore facility operators to perform key safety tests and that MMS uh, inspectors only review the paperwork associated with the tests. Uh, how is it that uh, adequate, how, is it, how can we make sure that it, we have adequate, um, uh, that is, uh, approval of these, um, of these reports? Uh, because there's a question of inspection that some of the inspections are not actually done by our people, but they're done by the Marshall Island folk and, and, uh, and people that they contract. So how can we guarantee that those inspections, are, which are so important, uh, are properly done? Well, let me say first, uh, there were inspections that were conducted at the Deepwater Horizon, uh, including uh, inspections in April and testing, including of the blowout preventer that occurred uh, in the days leading up to, to, to the explosion. Secondly, uh, we will have uh, a, a significantly more robust uh, inspection uh, regime, and it's uh, part of what Director Bromwich uh, will be working on, and he may want to comment on that. No, that, that's absolutely right. That's, that's one of the things we're going to be focusing on uh, most intently. They, they, the, the important inspections can't be paper inspections. They need to be done by human beings, and they need to be done by human beings with experience, uh, demonstrated competence, and an arm's length relationship, at least, uh, to the entities that, that own the facilities. I see my time is up. Thank you very much. Uh, the Secretary has got to leave at 12, and I'm going to try to get in as many members as we can before they have to leave to go to vote. Mr. Burton. Mr. Secretary. Five minutes. Uh, you know, 50,000 wells have been drilled in the Gulf without a problem, and yet the President put a moratorium on the drilling, and uh, as a result, you've had uh, some of the rigs go to uh, Egypt, to the Congo, Brazzaville, uh, in Canada, they're talking about new wells being drilled up to 6,500 feet in the Arctic waters. Uh, so we're going to lose a lot of those uh, rigs, and they probably won't come back, at least not for a long, long time. It makes no sense to me to cut off the drilling in the Gulf when you've not had any real problems except for this one, one uh, catastrophe. And, and I just don't understand why the administration is taking this carte blanche approach. Can you explain that? Congressman uh, Burton, having uh, been involved in this uh, matter in response to the Deepwater Horizon blowout every single day since uh, the blowout, I can tell you that uh, there are three fundamental questions that have to be answered uh, before we take our hand off the pause button, and those are the issues of drilling safety, uh, uh, oil well blowout containment, uh, as well as oil spill response uh, capacities. And that's what we are working on uh, with uh, Director Bromwich, as well as uh, with a whole host of well, other efforts. Well, you've already stated that it, there, there, there's more of a chance of a leak from a tanker than there is from one of these rigs. It, it just doesn't make any sense with a 50,000 drilling of wells in the Gulf, and you have one spill that you're going to cut off everything, and the, and the rigs are already moving to Brazzaville and the Congo. And Brazil, we just sent a billion dollars down to Brazil to help them deal, uh, drill in deep water areas. Uh, and so what we're doing in effect is shoving oil production away from the United States. And we're costing us jobs when there is really no reason for it except for this one exception. And what you're talking about, in my opinion, really doesn't make a great deal of sense. Now I want to ask a couple other questions real quick. Uh, I have a... Uh, uh, video I'd like to show to you real quick. It's about 15 seconds long. So can you cue up that video? Uh, Sal Salazar and the full town, I've been on the island two or three times. They've never once come back yep. with us. This is photo ops. Is Lisa Jackson been here? Uh, I don't know. Dana, do you have much contact on the staff level? If not the secretary, is there anybody on the yeah. Not with uh, Homeland Security, no. Mm -hmm. no Sal every time um, on the full town or Salazar's come to Grand Isle, they go off with some big wigs on a boat or a helicopter, something like that. I, I, they've never met with, you know, local homeland security. I don't think they've met with the town. 
In fact, she drove past me the last time she landed. I was standing at the airport waiting for you to come in, and she drove right past yeah. me. Well, the, the, this is uh, D Dino Bonanno, who's the Homeland Security Director down there, and the Fire Chief, Mark Scardino. Scardino. They said that you've never been down to uh, uh, that parish, uh, and it's one of the most toxic areas that's been hit uh, since this spill took place. Why haven't you been down there? Congressman uh, Burton, first of all, I believe that the last count that I saw, I had uh, 11 times that I have been uh, in one of the Gulf Coast states or have in you Houston. Have been to this parish? This I, is one of the hardest hit. I, I have been through Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida. I, I don't know the exact uh, parish by parish, but let me just say that uh, since April 20th and uh, even before that, I spent a lot of time in the Gulf Coast and I continue to spend a lot of time down there and will and uh, we'll work relentlessly on this problem until we get it fixed and we chart uh, the way forward. The and I will just say, areas. Congressman it Burton. Like this, it seems like this would have been one of the top priorities. I don't understand I mean, why you weren't there. And they were complaining very vigorously that you had ignored their, their problems there. We, the, the, the President, the Vice President, and members of the Cabinet have been down there countless times. My, well, assistant, secretary, my assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife has, has taken 17 yeah. trips down into that area well, to Mr. deal secretary, with these issues. You're the guy. Uh, you should have been there, in my opinion. Now, the last thing I want to ask is, I know the Jones Act was, uh, was referred to. There were a number of countries that wanted to bring skimmers in as soon as this thing took place. We could have eliminated an awful lot of these ecological problems if those skimmers had been brought in. Why in the world didn't we let all these other countries bring those skimmers in as quickly as possible? Uh, Mr. Burton, I disagree with you. Uh, the fact is the Jones Act has not kept a single vessel well, from coming into the, the country, in? number one. Uh, we have the shortage of, uh, of, of skimming vessels has not been an issue, and the Jones Act those has not been a vessel. Why weren't from other countries? Why weren't they allowed in? They were brought in as uh, they were required, and uh, Thad Allen and the National Incident Commander After have been what, in charge of it. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Dryhouse, five uh, thank, minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my intent wasn't to rebut my Republican colleagues in this hearing, but given what was just said uh, about the exception uh, of this disaster, it's like suggesting that 9 11 was an exception to air traffic control regulations and that we shouldn't react to that. The fact is, this has been an environmental disaster. And the fact is that we should look at the regulation appropriately of oil wells in the Gulf. And I think it's very appropriate that the administration take the steps that it has to make sure that all of the wells are safe. Uh, I further heard my Republican colleagues suggest that it's limitations on onshore drilling and other parts of the country that is driving BP and others to go to the Gulf. I assume that they're making money in the Gulf that the reason we have all these wells in the Gulf is because there's oil there and they're making money. Is that correct? That is correct. And so the reason that BP and, it, and the other oil companies are in fact drilling is because they're making a profit in the Gulf. That is correct. I, I'd like to move on. And, and I think the issue here is, is one that's important. And it, and it dates back to the 2005 Energy Act and the, the issue of categorical exclusions. Um, I'm concerned, as are others. Um, with regard to the number of categorical exclusions that we have seen uh, for wells in the Gulf. And I, I would appreciate if you would help us better understand uh, how categorical exclusions are determined and whether or not BP advocated aggressively for categorical exclusions for its drilling operations in the Gulf. Uh, Congressman, uh, let me just say, uh, First of all, but just back on the moratorium, I, it is a prudent position that we have taken, and, and I appreciate uh, the support that you echo for that moratorium because of these fundamental issues that we do need to have addressed. Uh, secondly, with respect to your uh, the question on, on categorical exclusions, they appear at a time when after, after significant environmental uh, analysis has been done because the process is uh, in developing a five-year plan, you do an environmental impact statement. Uh, before you issue, uh, a, have a lease sale, there is another environmental impact statement that is reviewed. So there are a series of reviews that happen. Now, the categorical exclusion in part in the Gulf of Mexico, which have been granted to more than BP, uh, those occur in large part because there is a 30-day window of, uh, of approval required by statute when an exploration plan itself is filed as part of the, 
leasing and development process. And so we have asked the, the Congress to extend that 30-day uh, window to a 90-day window, and, and I, I hope that it is something that you enact in the uh, oil spill legislation that is before you. When, when you say that 30-day window is in statute, when was that 30-day window implemented, and why was it implemented? Why was it only 30 days, and who advocated for the 30-day window? I do not uh, have the specifics on uh, when that uh, requirement was put into, into the law, but I can get that for you. Uh, do you believe, yeah, what, what is your opinion as to how long it should be for, for the review? You, you said 90 days. Is 90 days appropriate? Uh, with 30 days, I believe, is, uh, is too short. And I do think that uh, what we need to do, especially in places like the Gulf of Mexico, you have tremendous environmental information and reviews that have already been conducted. And so we just need to make sure that the environmental reviews that are being uh, conducted are, uh, are, are, are worthwhile and uh, that uh, we're doing the right thing in terms of the aim of uh, the environmental analysis, which is to understand what impacts there will be to the environment from uh, the activity. Do you believe that there's been an overuse of categorical exclusions uh, under the previous administration and, um, and the 30-day window is a primary cause of that? Uh, I do believe that there was uh, an over uh, use of the categorical exclusions and indeed with respect to what we have already done on the onshore under the Bureau of Land Management is uh, we have changed that practice and uh, obviously we are now conducting a comprehensive review with uh, the Council of Environmental Quality relative to the environmental reviews and changes that need to happen with respect to OCS. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Uh, Mr. Murphy. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I know we're about to go to votes, and Secretary Salazar, you've been great to spend so much time with us. I, I appreciate your measured response to Mr. Burton's question. Um, I think we could be here uh, for days on end if we were going to play videos of single individuals who were upset that one particular federal official didn't visit them. Um, I, I think we're very lucky to have you in this position. Uh, so many of us have been impressed by your uh, immediate and robust response to this mm -hmm. tragedy. Uh, and Mr. Bromwich, uh, you have a reputation as a, a, a no-nonsense administrator in everything you've done, um, and I think you're the right guy for the job. Um, I just have a couple quick questions. Um, one relevant to funding sources moving forward. Um, the reorganization, as you split into three different entities, is going to require more people in and of itself, three directors, maybe three offices of congressional relations. We know that we need more uh, people to do, uh, uh, to do the inspection work. Um, as you look down the road at how you think uh, the agency should be funded and you look at uh, a, a potential diminishing reliance on royalty payments, um, how do you expect that um, moving forward the new functions of these agencies are going to be funded? Uh, Congressman Murphy, thank you for your uh for your comments. Um, we are in the midst of uh, working uh, with uh, the appropriators uh, in developing uh, the budget amendments to make sure that uh, the funding is, is there to be able to do the job. Uh, the funding sources themselves and uh, where they will come from, that will be part of that discussion that we'll engage with, uh, with Congress on. And with respect to royalty payments, do you um, have ideas today as to what components will be continued to be funded by royalty payments or what components you no longer want to be funded with respect to royalty payments? That is uh, part of the review that we currently have uh, underway in the implementation programs that we are developing. Um, and, and maybe I'll direct this question to Mr. Bromwich, but be happy to have the Secretary weigh in as well. Um, one of the things that has been of great frustration to us is the technology that we're using right now to deal with this bill and the fact that we've had a, you know, a fairly slow pace of innovation within the industry in developing new technologies to address spills. Um, maybe it's moving a lot faster right now as we speak, but over a long period of time it's been relatively slow given the threat. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you foresee um, either within your agency or in, uh, or in putting pressure on the industry, um, how do we more quickly advance oil spill um, disaster mitigation technology, oil spill response technology going, uh, going forward? Yes, it's a very good question. I think one of the things that this disaster has focused people's attention on generally is the lack of advances in containment technologies as well as in oil spill response technologies. Uh, that's not only been recognized by Secretary Salazar and me and many others, it's been recognized by 
players in the industry. And I think that's one of the uh, reasons why yesterday we saw the, the four largest majors come forward with uh, the outlines of a plan to deal with containment, oil spill containment in the Gulf of Mexico. I think that, that this disaster has focused people's energies. It will stimulate uh, innovation. Uh, we'll, we'll obviously be directly involved in that process. Uh, the proposal that was made yesterday uh, is an interesting one. It's an intriguing one, but we're going to want to review and study it carefully. We'll ask for more elaboration on it by the companies. It's, it's one that not only we, but you and the American public is going to need to have confidence in. Mr. Issa for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just one, one quick question. Uh, would you, you know, Mr., uh, Mr. Secretary, that your decision was, by definition, for six months of a moratorium arbitrary. In light of what you said earlier today, would you say that resources that are freed up at the time of the kill of this well could just as easily be the end of the moratorium? As you said earlier, clearly there were resources that you didn't want to have not available if something on one in 50,000 wells happened a second time. But wouldn't a target of the killing of this well be just as appropriate for considering limited, well-supervised uh, roll, rolling back into exploration of the existing 22 rigs? Uh, Congressman, uh I appreciate your observation, and I also appreciate the sense of uh, urgency that you have that these issues be addressed. Uh, but let me say there is a tremendous amount of work that is unfolding. I will have uh, a report back uh, from uh, the Oversight Safety Board, which I established, which includes great work from the Inspector General and her staff that are focused in on uh, some of these safety issues. That is due, I believe, on uh, August the 15th. The National Academy of Engineering arm of the National Academy of Sciences will have an interim report for me by October the 31st. And obviously the multiple investigations that are underway are informing us. So if there is a point in time uh, between now and November 30th where the three fundamental questions that I, I have already addressed are addressed to our satisfaction, we will revisit uh, that timeline for the moratorium. I appreciate that. I yield the balance of time, Mr. Fortenberry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for joining us today, Mr. Bromwich. Uh, this oil spill is an environmental catastrophe. BP was a reckless actor, and clearly all of us must work together to ensure three things, that this leak has continued to be stopped, that the environment's cleaned up, and that we work uh, with all the resources we have to ensure that this never happens again. In that regard, I think Mr. Ice has made a reasonable point, and you've answered it reasonably, that pr your reasoning for the moratorium is that our resources are currently deployed and perhaps depleted, and in case there was a second spill or catastrophe like this, we would not have the resources to work against it. But given that there is the potential for this leak to be permanently stopped in the near term, your consideration of that factor in terms of the moratorium deadlines I think is reasonable. The second point, though, being um, given that um, the resources that are applied are under intense pressure to potentially move overseas and that this would cause more imported oil to come into our waters, more tankers, which are inherently more environmentally dangerous <clears throat> than the drilling itself. Is the moratorium timeline potentially more risky? A related point is that all drilling is not the same. Now, BP was clearly engaged in the riskiest type of drilling. There is partial drilling, there is development drilling. Uh, is there a consideration that those may be exempted as well, given that their risk profile is lower? Uh, Congressman, the answer to that is, uh, is uh, yes, and that's part of what uh, Director Bromwich uh, will be uh, gathering information on. There may be different activities uh, and different zones of risk uh, that might be allowed uh, to go forward. We have already made one of those findings with respect to the shallow water uh, drilling, and there may be others as uh, we move forward. So a segmentation of risk, risk profiling based upon the actual uh, historical past, uh, 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 the historical analysis of risk based upon the type of drilling rather than a blanket moratorium. 
There, there may be, for example, Congressman, uh, you know, the, the differentiation between uh, the exploration wells and the deep water and uh, uh, wells that are being drilled into uh, already de uh, developed uh, reservoirs where you know exactly what it is that you're drilling into uh, as opposed to the, uh, the exploratory type of wells, which the Maconda well was one. And so those are the kinds of distinctions that uh, we will be taking a look at in, in the months ahead. Well, I think the last thing we want to do is increase pressures for more imported oil, which puts more tankers into our water, which, again, traditionally has been more of a high, or has a higher environmental risk of spillage than the drilling operations. With that said, I also would like to point out that I visited the area recently, one of the coastal communities. These people are exhausting themselves, trying to save their land, save their way of life, and save the environment. I think you've heard. Time has expired. I had a good video for you, Ms. Secretary, but we'll have to do it another time. Uh, Ms. Maloney. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam uh, Chair, and I uh, thank uh, Secretary Salazar and Mr. Brownwich for your, your testimony. The uh, devastation of the BP oil spill has highlighted many problems in worker safety and containment and oversight, uh, but it has especially highlighted the mismanagement of the MMS, the Minerals and Management Service Agency, which if managed appropriately could literally bring in millions if not billions uh, to our Treasury from oil extracted uh, from land owned by the American people. Under, under the uh, current structure, the General Accounting Office has found that the MMS uh, should do a great deal more to improve the accuracy of the data used to collect and verify the oil royalties. I, I have a bill in H.R. 1462 which would require the National Academy of Engineering to study and come forward with uh, uh, improvements and recommendations of ways that we could more accurately collect uh, the royalties on the production of oil. I would like, uh, Mr. Secretary, if you would review it, and certainly this could be helpful in, in defining it in a way that we could be uh, more successful in, in uh, giving the American people, the taxpayers, their, their just uh, reward or their just tax revenues or their rep revenues from this oil. According also to the General Accounting Office report that was given to this committee, the revenue share uh, that the government collects from oil and gas produced in the Gulf ranks 93rd among the lowest of the 104 revenue collection uh, regimes around the world. Is that an accurate statement? Are we 93rd in collection? I have not. I cannot comment on that uh, statistic, but I will say this, that we have uh, been implementing uh, many of the recommendations from the General Accounting Office, uh, as well as uh, recommendations that came forth uh, from uh, uh, the uh, Kerry um, uh, Garns Commission that address many of these issues. And at the end of the day, what we're looking at is to achieve the objective which you outlined, which is to make sure that we're getting a fair return back to the American taxpayer, and we'd be delighted to take a look at your bill. Did you testify earlier that this has not been updated since the 1920s in your, in your statement? Uh, no, I did not. The, the, that was a referral to the royalty rate that is established under the 1920 Mineral Leasing Act with respect to onshore uh, oil and gas leasing, and uh, that is something which we have been reviewing and do believe it should be changed. So that has not been updated since the 1920s. We certainly should look at that and bring it into the uh, 21st century. Uh, also, the, the GAO report uh, reported that uh, MMS does not audit oil and gas company royalty numbers. Is that correct at this point? That was the GAO report. Yeah, there are auditing functions that uh, do occur, and in fact, that's why we go back and uh, do collections uh, from, from, from companies where they have underpaid, and that uh, does happen on an ongoing basis. But as I said, we are in the process of uh, implement, implementing uh, numerous recommendations that have come uh, from GAO, uh, the several commissions, as well as uh, recommendations from our Inspector General. But uh, is it fair to say that we could be under collecting by millions, possibly billions, in this, uh, in this uh, royalty program? 
I think it is fair to say that uh